Hello and welcome back to Reactivity TV. I'm Amy Albero and I'm a licensed therapist. I am Chris. I'm not a licensed therapist, but what I am is thankful. This week, I am thankful for Austin for salvaging what was, up until the point that he self-eliminated, the most boring and lack of rizzed episode I have ever seen uh, in the five seasons we've been watching this show. I don't know if that's the proper usage of riz, but I'll go oh, with it. Please, like the kids these days know how to use the word riz <laughs> as well. No, I'm I'm excited to talk about Austin and his self-elimination, mostly because it kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit more on Jen. And we're seeing a lot more about her and her readiness, her maturity. I have so much to talk about when we get to that point. So yes, yeah, thank is you, it, Austin. Is it safe to say that um, Jen is behaving like our health right now and is aggressively fading hardcore? I mean, our health certainly is fading. Yeah. I think, I don't know if Jen is fading. My opinion of her is fading, but I am going to do my best to keep my therapist perspective intact and, and try to demonstrate some empathy for her, even though as a viewer, I'm I'm feeling pretty frustrated. Yeah, it was not great. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, the quick uh, opening up here, uh, as you can probably tell just from our voices, we are both very sick this week, um, but we are still coming to you with a recap this week of episode five, season 21 of The Bachelorette, which is Jen Tran season. You, you stole my lines, but it's, it's fine. It's <laughs> fine. I can take yours too. Um, and uh, before we get into all of that, please be sure to hit that like button at the bottom of this video and also hit subscribe and hit that bell icon so that you can stay updated to all of the new content right when it hits our channel. I had to take advantage of my voice while I still had it. <laughs> this morning I woke up and I was like, there's no way we're podcasting. Like I had absolutely no voice. Um, and so I'm just thankful we got this far today. Yeah, we so. have to keep keep the main thing, the main thing over here. Yeah. And that's you guys. All right. So shall we talk about just quick opening thoughts? Opening thoughts, you know, this is an episode that I actually had to watch twice because the first time watching through truly was a little bit like a fever dream, but the, but also because I felt like I wasn't really able to like grab on to anything. Um, and then the second time through, I, I was able to pick up on a little bit more of what I found interesting to talk about. But all of that to say, to your point about it lacking Riz, yeah, this was kind of a lackluster episode. Although the men really brought it this week, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm I'm a big fan of of the guys in general. Um, coming away from this episode, that's my my main take. Yeah, that was an episode that had so much content and so many things happened, and I just did not care about any of it, mm. none of it. Um, you know, from the Matthew thing to you know, we had two different rose ceremonies and sort of kind of two cocktail um, parties, as well as three dates, and still through all of it, I'm just like, I, n nothing is happening. Things are happening, but nothing that's jumping out at me. I the think. Sorry to cut you off, yeah. but as you're as you're saying that, I'm sort of agreeing, and I think. What I'm coming to the conclusion of is Jen has become a really hard bachelorette to root for. Mm, yeah. um, and so I don't feel as invested in her, you know, ending as I did, for example, Joey, our king. But I so now I'm kind of like, OK, like, let's just see how this shit show unravels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple things that were noteworthy. One, I think Sam M got probably the first mm -hmm. reasonably good edit of the season. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Devin had some moments where he got. I would say some some negative um, edits in this week's episode, although not really bad. I mean, it was still a good edit for him, but it was probably his worst edit of the season. Um, Grant, who I have been real kind of like, I don't know about this guy. He looked awesome this episode. Really, I mean, he got he got a great edit. Um, and then Jonathan is the real surprise. He got the worst non-villain edit you could probably get. He got the edit of this is what all the girls claim they want, but will never pick. And that's the edit he got this week. And I thought that was devastating mm. for his chances. Ooh, interesting. Okay, well, definitely save your voice for that. Okay, I, you want that I, one. I want to yeah. <laughs> hear about that for sure. Um, so let's let's get into our newish segment, Good Date, Bad Date. We had three dates. This is going to be a real fast segment. Spoiler, <laughs> they all sucked. All of them. So uh, our first date was um, helicopter ride. Another helicopter ride. Is anyone else tired of putting Jen in the air? I, I just. Well, they even referenced that. Like, oh, how yeah. many times are we going to go to the Heights date? So we had yeah. a helicopter ride slash winery slash 
hot tub. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then we had a farming date. Yeah. And then we had a horseback riding beach picnic in the rain. Yeah. Date. Yeah. I, I mean, just doing them in order. We've already talked about the helicopter date. I don't like the helicopter date. Certainly not as like a first date or an intimate date for all the reasons. Go back and listen to the episode two episodes ago. When we talked about it. Um, not a huge fan. I thought the winery was better. I liked the I liked that they had, had some alone time where they would just, you know, dinking and dunking around the winery, doing fun stuff, running around, playing games. I liked their interaction there. Yeah. I liked that they had solo one on one time. Playful, yeah. Um But it was a missed opportunity. We so mm -hmm. we were on vacation last week, if if you watched, you you know that. And we did a wine tasting and one of the things that we love we did a Mexican uh wine tasting. And one of the things that we love about the wine tasting is learning about the history of wine from that particular country. And New Zealand has fantastic wine. And I feel like the show's been doing such a good job of cultural appreciation. And this was such a missed opportunity for them and us as the viewers to not like have them actually do a winery wine tasting experience. And so like had they have done that on on the date, I would have put it more on the goodish side mm. of a date. But because they just played hide and seek in the winery, they did throw grapes in each other's mouths from 10 feet off. That was impressive. That I, it wasn't very impressive. Maybe that impressive. was all their lacrosse skills. That's that's learned. what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I, I thought of the three dates, this was probably the best of the three. But I mean, realistically speaking, um, I, you know, I didn't think that the only thing that salvaged it was the fact that they had some one-on-one -on -one time mm. um, and they were at least able to have some conversations. They had the dinner, you know, fantastic. But, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're talking a C-plus date, in my opinion. Mm, I put it more in the in the B range, but it would be a low B for me. Okay. okay. That's fair. Next date was at the farm. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, they were shoveling shit. <laughs> like what part of this is a date? This wasn't a date. This was, this was a hell's kitchen punishment. That's what this was. <laughs> I didn't even understand this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the kind of like hosts, the couple that hosted Oh, that the was date. a highlight. No, it was, it was for sure. And, and we definitely will, we'll talk about them, but I think like initially they were trying to like make a link between farming and dating, but then like we didn't see that link come together like in the date. The only thing I did appreciate about this date was that Jen was participatory, part participating. Yes. So there were opportunities, but the guys just didn't missed opportunities all around. Again, we'll oh, get yeah. to that. The so best part of this entire date um, was, and we're getting ahead to the actual events of the date, was when the, the farmer was mm -hmm. like, yeah, not a lot of collective intelligence out of you. <laughs> and it's so funny when you saw Jen's reaction. She had a lot of defensive reactions this episode. Um, and that was one of them. But it's like, yeah, hello, open the gate. You're not going to get anything to go through a gate that's closed. We even had a bona fide farmer on the date and he- Yeah, he just, just fail all around. But anyway, yeah, I mean, at least it was participatory. But yeah. I mean, again, like- There was no romance to be had. No, there was, there was, this, this was, this was a hell's kitchen punishment is what this was. <laughs> yeah. And there's no- like there's there's no romance there's no yeah it was terrible so is this like a full f for there's you? a full f oh, wow. yeah full on f okay yeah. i go like d minus you are forgiving this week <laughs> well i'm about to get really harsh so okay. i'm just like saving it for that. gotcha all right um so date three uh this was um what the heck did they do on date three horseback again riding. horseback riding all right let me tell you something grant was grant yeah grant is a hell of a lot better rider than tanner is let's just start <laughs> there um and a better conversationalist. Mm. So I'm going to give Grant, I'm giving you credit two ways here. Um, but the, the first thing was they weren't riding side by side. You see how far we both looked, we both, I was writing down, they're so far away, just as you said, they're so far away from each they other. They even gave us that overhead The shot. overhead view and they're like four <laughs> miles apart. And it's like, can you just imagine trying to crane your neck around trying to have a conversation like and yell? yelling? Like there's nothing, this, come on, this, this is not a good opportunity to get to know somebody. Um, they go and they do the picnic on the on the beach in the rain in the rain fine whatever at least it's one-on-one -on -one time to chat and talk but you know for anybody who's ever done a picnic on the beach like that it could go sideways really fast and you are susceptible to the weather and they got caught in it and so i'm just not sure when it starts to turn cold it starts to turn rainy you know you get a little wind you know kicking up and you get sand knocking everywhere like th this suddenly you're very distracted and so while this had the potential to be okay because you had that one-on-one -on -one time to sit down and chat and talk and get to know each other, uh, the elements, you were at the mercy of the elements and, and it, it really turned sideways. They did also have a dinner, you know, fine. Okay, great. Some more opportunities to talk. Do I think that they necessarily both took the best opportunity? No, we'll get into that later, but uh, you know, I don't know, C plus. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I'll, okay. I'll put it, put it at a C plus. So we're not at your, your vicious angry part yet? <laughs> no. Yeah. So I didn't say vicious and angry. I said I, I might be a little harsh. Harsh. Okay. 
All right, so we're basically very – we're ambivalent to negative on all these dates this week. Yeah. Production, maybe that added terrible. to like our feeling like this was a lackluster episode. Yeah. I mean, you've already done a helicopter in this same season. Mm-hmm. Two episodes ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come on. Production. Get your shit together, please. Give us some diversity, right? Um, all right, so shall we get into the uh, yeah. events of the episode? Yeah. When So we open up. And I was so confused. Like I again, I, I said fever dream. Like I I could not place where we were in space and time. Like when the episode opened, I like completely forgot that we are starting the episode off on that cliffhanger. Yeah, yeah, um, the cliffhanger that nobody cared about and was in no way, shape, or form all that interesting. Didn't um, result in anything. No, I mean, look at it. We, we opened the episode basically going straight into a cocktail uh, party where the first thing we're going to do is resolve this Matthew thing. Um, and yeah. that that within three minutes of the episode opening, we're already resolved that that plot, you know. And the, the real sad part is production, you know, they go through and they t- pick out all these clips that are supposed to be these big, you know, wow moments in in the in the season that's supposed to you're supposed to be waiting for all season. Wow, what's going to happen? And this thing with Matthew was like the thing that they've been trailering constantly and hyping up constantly. And this was it. Five minutes at the end of last episode of zero charisma man and then we go in and we get even less charisma this episode for three minutes and it's over it was it was pretty bad but long story short you know matthew and jen have a conversation yeah well first first jen goes in and tells the guys that her ex is here um and then says i'm gonna go talk to him so we get the guys reaction to what is transpiring and we see a little bit of the conversation between jen and matthew yeah, I mean, look, I, I think this was a, a part where Devin looked a little childish. You know, he was saying, you know, I, 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 this Rose means nothing if she lets him come on to the mm-hmm. show. I'm actually a little surprised that she didn't let him on because she's had a very difficult time saying no to anybody. Um, I but, wonder uh, if she knew Austin was leaving, if she would have let him on. Oh, interesting. I, I think that she's so craven. Like, I think that she is so in need of external validation. That was so nauseatingly obvious this um Mm. episode that i feel like having someone who flew halfway across the world for her would have probably uh been helpful spike the dopamine yeah 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 uh it's interesting Uh, yeah so you know sam m um during this whole thing he uh he actually you know gets in a few snarky comments here or there classic sam m um but this is where grant really starts to shine in this episode right at the beginning a lot of maturity, a lot of level-headedness, a lot of calmness, stuff that we haven't really had an opportunity to see from Grant. Um, he, you know, he he was came across as like this really kind of, you know, maybe a little egotistical, you know, bro kind of like type of guy. Boy. Yeah, at the very, you know, first episode. And then he's been very uh, tangential in the background the next four, uh, three episodes. And this is the first episode where he really got front and center. And I got to say, fantastic showing for him mm-hmm. in this episode mm-hmm. all around yeah we saw a little bit of that energy i don't know if it was last episode or the one before when he was talking to sam n and was kind of doing that like listen man i appreciate like the bravery to put yourself out there but like that that pro- that wasn't cool yeah like, we saw some of that level headedness i think that that was even the way that i described him in my notes uh then and we see that more now there is a groundedness there is such a sense of maturity about him and we see that at, at the top of this episode, and then we learn a little bit more about his context later on. Um, so this was a, an all-star episode for Grant. He really came away. He's not going to get my rose specifically, but he he was top-notch um, man <laughs> yeah. in this episode for me. Yeah, I agree. Um, but it was interesting to see how all the different men um, coped with the the information that they were going to be uh, mm-hmm. potentially getting a new competitor midway through. Um, you know, a lot of them talked about fairness. Um, you know, life right. isn't fair, you know, get a helmet. I don't know what to tell you. Well, I think, I think they also talk about, I think we hear Austin, um, we, we hear more from Austin this episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and Austin is, is kind of talking about how like, okay, this is an ex and we all have the idea of how powerful it might be to have an ex come in, um, come in the picture. Like they have shared experiences pr- predating this. They've been intimate. So like, there is this sense of like threat, a threat um, to the other men. So that in some way, I could understand why they are reacting the way that they are. And and so that was what I found most fascinating is like, okay, we're going to see how these men respond to this 
threat. And and yeah, we see like some fight or flight stuff come up with Devin. He's angry, kind of having a little bit of a tantrum. He's he's saying it's his past trauma getting uh, cheated on come back up. Yeah, we see Grant get grounded. We see Sam M kind of like lash out. Like it, it is really interesting. Marcus is like, there's no playbook for this, like so logical. Um, and so it's it's really interesting to see the way that the how different men respond to this. It's it's actually interesting um, take at at the very beginning. We were talking about how when the ex comes back, um, I actually don't agree with you or Austin. Um, an ex is an ex for a reason, and if an ex, if I'm attempting to woo or court a young lady, and it's me versus an ex, I feel like I have the upper hand. Two reasons why. Well, there's more than two, but two main reasons why. First reason is because the two of them already broke up once. They've already failed once. I haven't failed yet, right? Two, um, there's still an aura of unknown. Mm -hmm. There's less unknown. And people tend to like and tend to um, give more uh, heavy weight to the unknown. That's why as a therapist, you're supposed to be a blank slate, right? Mm -hmm. You're not really, people aren't supposed to know when a client comes in, they're not really then they get to know. project. They get to project what they want yeah. on top of, uh, onto you. And that's exactly the same thing that happens in dating until you get to know somebody. That's why the getting to know the courting process is so important. because you have to, <clears throat> you have to find out who these people are. I disagree. Really? I think in times of, of stress and discomfort, we want something that's familiar and that's what's comfortable. And that's why we see Jen relating every single scenario back to herself. It's the only way that she can- Why do you think that's because she's selfish? <laughs> well, there's that too. I mean, she, she's really another episode of her looking oh, this super is, selfish. This was worse it was, than it was, it was, it was way really worse bad. than two episodes ago. Yeah, it was bad. Um, so so I, don't, I don't know necessarily, like I see what you're saying. Like there is something alluring about the novelty of a new person and a new relationship. But again, in, in a heightened time of stress, which I will say this- experience probably is you typically you might lean towards something more familiar you at least lean toward familiar habits which is what we were talking about last episode um so i don't i don't think either of us are right or wrong but i think we're presenting two different takes here that that's fair i'm just saying you also I... are a more level-headed secure person than most than me even <laughs> so, <laughs> so um we might just represent two different types of people in in dating i mean i don't think we represent two different types of people uh i beat out your exes and you beat out <laughs> all my exes so i you know i can't remember were you intimidated by my exes i just asked you the other day do you think they're still married do you think they're married i still have some oh curiosity. that that's that's right you did just ask me and i'm like how would i know <laughs> like how do you not know how do you I, not want to know uh because well, i <laughs> I have an ex is an ex for a reason. Because next is next for a reason. Yeah, it's yeah. very healthy. I as a as a therapist, I would say like very very healthy. So let's kind of like fast forward through this bullshit as because again it was of no consequence. Jen and Matthew have this conversation where he shows no personality at all whatsoever and tells her that he's been in love with her and this is basically his last chance because he knows that she's going to get engaged at the end of this and he essentially like wants to throw his hat in the ring. Okay, fine. And Jen. Anybody who's ever interacted with a woman ever a single time in their life realized Jen's just not interested in him at all. Not at all. Zero at all. interest. There's, there's none. I think she feels flattered by the effort and by his comments, but we don't see him, her sending him home. What we do see, though, is that Matthew comes in the the room with all the guys and he essentially apologizes and says like, hey, I showed up here, wanted to, you know, shoot my shot, so to speak. And um, she said no. And, uh, you know, sorry if I... In, in interrupted your time here. Good luck. You know, she says her future's in this room. You know, very nice, I thought. Okay. No? I mean, I thought it was super beta. And, he, you know, you could just tell by the reaction of the guys. I mean, I thought Sam M didn't have to go with the snarky comment, but he was saying what basically every man was thinking like, you know, yeah, that right there is why she didn't pick you, dude. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. But I, that's not a, the type of man that she would want. Clearly, um, a beta. You mean? Yeah, because she, she wants she wants a Sam M. She wants a jerk. Yeah, we don't need to use the M anymore. Remember that was that's true. We don't need the Sam. We don't need the M. Yeah, <laughs> we don't need the Sam either. I mean, just, I'm just waiting for that to, <laughs> to expire. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. I mean, you're you're probably right that like that kind of behavior or attitude is is not attractive to Jen. Clearly, the the men that she is attracted to 
do have a little bit more, quite a bit more of like an alpha personality. And Look at who's in the room. Yeah. I mean, you have all hardcore. You got Marcus, six tours, right? In the military. You got Grant, who is super alpha. You've got Sam M, who is, you know, constantly, constantly trying to be the big dog in the room, right? I mean, Devin, you know, Devin who's a big personality. Mm -hmm. Dylan, still to this point, right? I mean, you got big, bro -y alpha guys in this room. You know, the, 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 the beta that you've got is you got a Spencer. Even Jeremy, Jeremy is like, he, he's, he's not, he's not beta. Jeremy is not beta. He's not necessarily the hardcore alpha, but like, you know, he's the guy who walks in with the big, with the big car and at the first episode and that whole thing. Like, so, you know, he's just taking a different tack because he's not six, six, you know, with muscles everywhere, you know? Um, yeah, there, there is not a comp to Matthew in that room. Right. Right. Yeah. And that no, tells you something. That, that's a really, really good point. So he leaves and we get right into the row ceremony. The guys clearly feel relieved. And um, and so we get no cocktail party. Row ceremony goes as follows. You know, we have the three guys that already have their roses, Devin, Sam, Marcus. And then everybody else gets a rose except for um, Thomas and John M. Again, no surprises there. No. I mean, John M was a guy, seems like a nice enough guy, but prior to an episode ago, we didn't even know he was on the show. I mean, we yeah. just zero not a, time. Not a him. lot of screen time or time time with Jen that was notable. Yeah, and we knew Thomas N was not long for this competition. Mm -hmm. He was he was on the way out. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I thought the most notable part was that we didn't get any one on one time. In fact, we don't get any one on one time. It, we, we get two rose ceremonies and no cocktail party in this episode, mm -hmm. which is crazy. When you really think about it. Yeah, it, it is. And it's also not. And if any any of these men have watched the show before, they should know that cocktail parties are fewer and farther between um, on this franchise are not guaranteed, as I think Spencer has said later in the game. So like you can't wait. You can't wait around for a cocktail party yep. to make your move. Um, one one last thing that I wanted to to make note of before we get into the rest of the episode is that following um, Matthew's departure and this cocktail party, Jen says... Um, I feel like I closed the door on the woman I used to be. And there was a part of me that rejoiced when I heard this because, again, it reminded me of what I had said last episode around like she has a choice right now. She has a path to pick around which narrative she's going to choose. It, am I going to choose the I'm I'm a victim in my story or I, do I get to turn the page and be the hero in my story? And I really, really thought she was going to choose a different path. Spoiler, she did not. She does not. Yeah, no surprises with the cocktail party at all, uh, or the rose ceremony, rather. Yeah, I don't think there's really much to say. Agree. Yeah. All right. So go on to the one-on-one -on -one date. Yes. All right. Well, um, we already alluded to it earlier. It was another helicopter date. Um, Except yeah. the the twist of plot is that it's Jonathan. It's that's Jonathan afraid who's of afraid of heights. Okay, well, that's great. I mean, I don't. And Jen it, has magically faced her fear. Yeah, Jen suddenly because she's done so much stuff. Um, up, it, up in the therapy. air, yeah, exa exactly. Exposure therapy. And suddenly, she's no longer scared of heights, and she's the one who's who's pacifying him. I was there anything that we've seen this season less attractive than you know, big strong Jonathan, like having to overcome his fears of being in a helicopter, and yeah, it just the whole thing uh, was it was just over the top. Is there anything more attractive, unattractive? Yes, it comes in the next date when, similar to the last date. La uh, sorry, last week's date when I talked about men lack ath athleticism is such a turnoff. Yeah, men who lack the ability to do any of that outdoorsy shit was also a big turnoff. So yes, yes. Fair, fair, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, this whole date was a struggle for me because Jonathan was just coming off as weak during the helicopter ride. They then go to the vineyard and he has a moment. I'm like, okay, great. He's at the vineyard. He's doing his thing. They're fun. They're playful, whatever. But then when it felt to me like, he had, he had like read the book of like, this is what women say they want. They want you to be, you know, emotional and in touch with your thing, uh, you know, with your emotions and, and just like, <laughs> you, you know, like all the cliches, you know, that, 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 you know, when you watch like rom-coms and stuff like that, this is what the guy is. But well, in reality, guy that it, like, and he just kept trying to go to this like emotional place well, and he just... kept referencing how he wants a rom-com type of love yeah and so it was as though he was trying to play that character like them frolicking in the in the vineyard was kind of like 
oh, you're you're playing you're playing a character right now. Like you are like creating your own movie montage. Like it felt so not not like um purposefully performative. I'm not accusing him of that. I don't sure. think it was that at all. It just felt like they were trying too hard. That exactly. 100% agree. Trying too hard didn't come across as authentic and genuine on any level and also might just be my personal experience. But that's not the guy that women pick at the end of the day. Well, it's the guy that they say they want and they will never actually pick. Well, I don't know specifically what you are referring to when you say that. But I but I wonder if part of like what made for me the the beginning part of the date was super cringy because it felt like they didn't really have much chemistry or mm-hmm. compatibility. And it felt like they were trying to force it or fake it or make something there that wasn't there. Um, and so that's where it felt like so you could have put like goofy music on in the background um, and I would have, it would have fit. Like it just, mm-hmm. it, the whole date felt super awkward to me. Yeah. And then we get to the nighttime portion. Oh, before we get to the nighttime portion, they have this hot tub portion. And this is where I think I turned to you and I said, I really like that Jonathan did this, that he was very transparent. He says to her that he has a fear that their connection is friendly and worries that they uh, might not be able to connect on a, a an emotional or romantic level and i thought which is what we heard in her face to camera earlier we did we don't know when that was filmed sure, yeah. but they were both on the same page here but i i like that he he took the opportunity to be that's vulnerability sure yeah um, and that was really transparent and risky because again jen's insecure and so to say that um does kind of put you on your back foot a little bit and and so i, I think it was really meaningful and I, I respected him a lot for putting that out there Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that I think was the only part of the date that I didn't find cringy, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree with you. I, I, I like that he owned it, came right in, talked about it. Um, that might be the only positive comment I've got of this entire date. It just it just didn't land for me at all. It did feel like they were a little bit friend zoned. Um, it, it didn't feel authentic, didn't feel genuine, mm-hmm. didn't feel like there was a lot of chemistry there. You know, he felt like he was playing a character, you know, and I don't think it's a character that she would pick. In their daytime portion, yes. Mm-hmm. Then well, we, even, even the dinner portion. Well, yeah, I want to get into that. Yeah. So, because I think it's a different, I, I see what you're saying in the daytime portion. In the nighttime portion, I, I, I don't think that they are compatible at all. I thought she was sending him home, but you have I, 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 I really honestly thought the same thing. I mean, first off, Fellas, if you are on a first for first date with a young lady, you do not tell her, hey, by the way, one of my exes called me a controlling, manipulative freak. It's like, dude, abusive, abusive. It's like, dude, maybe hang on to that one. Right. Let's let's g- let her get a well, feel for you before you give her the negative opinions of your exes about you. Like, co- am I the crazy one here? No, no, that was that was um, those were some some really heavy adjectives to put on yourself. Um, granted they were, they were from someone else's mouth, but yeah, that, that was a lot. He came in with an agenda. I, I had meant to write down what he actually said, but he said something like, I have a couple of things to cover. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought like, <laughs> okay, buddy. Um, did the, you get the notes, the meet, the meeting agenda yeah, ahead of time? Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. he like came into it really wanting, I think, I think again, I always want to give people the benefit of the doubt here, even Sam. Um, but I think he did come in feeling like, okay, we got to figure this out. Mm-hmm. Like she, we got to get down to business here <laughs> and I've got to tell her the stuff about me. We've got to try to get deep. We've got to go there fast. So like there are these two main things I need to hit. One, my ex that had a substance misuse issue and who um, reacted to me reacting to her and um, my family and my upbringing and the way that that affected me. Mm-hmm. And so- I can understand. Again, you are, Austin used these words, playing catch up. You are playing catch up. It is week five. We are a week, two weeks away from hometowns. Like you got to get, you got to get there. Which is crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Um, And so like I understand in his, like the sense of urgency to like spill all this stuff. The way he, he talked about it though was like a little like, ooh. Eek. Yeah, it was it was hard to it was like a train wreck or a car accident in slow motion. Mm-hmm. It was not it was not good. Yeah, no. Um, and Jen's reactions. I, first off, she kept having weird faces and weird reactions, which was kind of a a, a mainstay in this entire episode. Um, and then she did, and, and I really wanted to get your opinion on this. This felt like an episode where we could have played the game. 
um, is this vulnerability or is this like trauma matching? And I felt like this was another case where Jen is just trying to, and she did the whole episode, I felt like trauma matching where, oh, you said something and now I'm going to try and match the trauma. Like, oh yeah, you're talking about addiction. Um, you know, oh yeah, I worked in the ER. I know all about addiction. I've seen it before. And it's like, okay, like, you know, and look, I've been very guilty of this. You know, when you when you are in an uncomfortable situation, somebody shares some vulnerability and you don't really know how to respond. So you're trying to search for empathy or, you know, so, something to kind of relate and you say something and like after you say it, you know, you think back and you're like, yeah, that, that probably wasn't very helpful. It was the best I could do, but like I really didn't do a good job of it. So I'm not saying it was malicious or narcissistic or anything like that. Like, I, I've been guilty of this many times, especially in my in my younger days. Um, but it, it felt like this was an episode where none of that landed well. And she was constantly searching for ways to be relatable and empathic. And she pretty much misses across the board in this episode. I agree. Um, in your notes, you called it trauma trading, um, which oh, I... that sounds like a good... I, I called it trauma trading? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet. Look at um, that. Which I, I, liked, I liked the alliteration. So I wanted to make sure I gave you some credit there. Nice. Um, but I... I agree. So you 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 you're cribbing off my off my notes. You, you, <laughs> you're plagiarizing my points. I'm giving you your credit. Oh, is that is that what's happening? <laughs> plagiarizing. That's not how that works. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, um I do agree that that she was kind of um almost like yeah, trauma training I think is a really good idea um at, in in theory of of what's happening that someone tells her something you know, stressful or traumatic that has happened in their life. And she, um, in exchange, does the same thing. And you're right that people do this in an effort to try to relate, to try to make the other person feel more comfortable, to really to make ourselves feel more comfortable. With Jen, I fear that it's to um, recenter the conversation on herself, um, which uh, whether that's her motivation or not, that's in part what it does. It completely invalidates the person when we when we trade our trauma story, when we cash it in after someone else has given um, us theirs. And, and she does the, a, a terrible thing as therapists. We, should, we never, never should do, um, or and just as people, we should never do because it's impossible to have this experience. She says, I know exactly how you feel. Hmm. I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. Um, and doing that is, again, so invalidating. And she can't miss an opportunity to to make something about herself, to have another opportunity to talk about her toxic ex. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be um, very, very off-putting. The, the, the conversation then pivots away from um, his ex with the substance misuse issue, and he starts to share about his family. So he shares with her about watching his family go through turmoil, he calls it, and um, he that he grew up seeing a lot of sadness and and then she asks him, do you feel like you had to put on a stronger front for your family? Do you feel like it's why you don't want to show that side of you because it feels like a weakness? And I felt like, oh, my gosh, this is, again, therapist, the, ther the therapist in me. So my therapist caution flags are going wild because this is a um, something that like as a as a brand new therapist or as somebody that plays like armchair psych. Um, what we typically see people want to do is filter someone else's experiences through our own and then give them back um, our our experience. Does that make sense? I think I follow. Yep. So she's doing exactly that. She's saying, OK, I hear something that's a little bit familiar. That sounds like something that I went through. I'm going to um, filter it through that experience. Think about um, how this impacted me. Think about my insights that I've gained through that. And I'm going to give it back to you, project it onto you, basically, um, so that we have something to relate about. And she that's exactly what she does here. Um, and then she goes on to say, I'm only saying that because I've been through very similar things. And she, again, takes it as an opportunity to pivot away from him and back to herself mm -hmm. and talk about, again, her. It, she's got two hits that she makes, toxic ex, dad who left. She can't have a conversation without mentioning these two men in her life that have gravely disappointed her. It, it's it's really, really hard to watch conversation after conversation. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, it's every single conversation. It's either pivoting to those two points 
um, you know, her her odd reactions and her inability to sort of, you know, be empathic in the moment. And then Jonathan tries to engage her in a conversation and he says something. He says, so they're talking about, um, you know, gr- growing up in this way and how, um, you know, vulnerability gets seen as weakness, which she talks about that later. I really want to talk about that. But he says something to her like, you know, it is a two way street, though. And her, she gives like a side eye, takes a drink. And and that's she's interpreting it as no, no, no. You need to take responsibility, too which is what I would say. That's not actually what he was saying. He was saying like, listen, I hear you say that like being vulnerable is hard, but it's also your partner's job to say like, hey, you're shutting down on me. Um, But she she was so defensive and so defended and didn't even hear what he had to say because she when she responds to him, she again was like, well, (laughs) anyway, like she just could not tolerate again, a challenge to her narrative. Yeah, I am amazed that this ended in a rose. I don't really understand how he got the rose, other than the fact that we've said in the past that she really has not had it. She, she hasn't demonstrated a strong ability to actually tell a guy, I'm not into you. It's time for you to go. And the only time she sends a guy home is when, I mean, it's the most low hanging of fruit situations, yeah. right? Um, and I think Jonathan is a nice guy. I think he was trying to do all the right things. Um, I think he checks a lot of boxes that a lot of people would really like. And so, a guy like that, I, I just don't think she has a backbone. She says something really important later on in the episode. And I like threw my hands up in the air. I was like, exactly. And that's when she said, am I just doing a bad job as a bachelorette? It's like, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. You're not a strong lead. You're actually not a great bachelorette. And it's it's tragic to say because like I really liked her on Joey's season. And I think she's probably a really nice and genuine, sweet human being. And I think she does mean well. But – this was the concern we had about her in the previews uh, originally. And when she was first announced, we said, I don't know if she's strong enough and mature enough. And we are seeing it week after mm-hmm. week after mm-hmm. week. She's not. Yeah. Yeah. This this was, this was again, not a good episode for her. I, again, that, that part of her monologue, I really want to get to because, mm-hmm. again, that's where I, I can have some empathy for her. Um, but I, I just – I'm working on my conceptualization of her and what's happening. And I – like, again, I think because I'm not feeling well, my, like, fogginess is not letting me connect the pieces in a way that is as deep or eloquent as I'd like to. But I – I can't help but continue to see the pattern and the the threads around Jen clearly emphasizes and seeks out similar experiences in other people. She can see a kernel of something and have find a way to relate it back to what her terrible exper- terrible experiences have been. And sometimes it feels like she's trying to force it and we see that on these two one-on-one dates that she's been on. And the 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 where like my fogginess is impacting my conceptualization my ability to verbalize that is i think that she is really seeking out like opportunities for these similar experiences because they're a way for her to try to feel better about what's happened to her that if she can um give them whether it's validation or approval or or whatever um that she can feel better about it for herself because the way the way that she, again, tr- almost like it feels like she's trying to force a round peg into a square hole most of the time when she's like drawing these connections where I'm like, I don't see it. I don't mm-hmm. see why, why, how you're, how you're relating to, it. I don't know why after every conversation you have, you have to end it in, oh my gosh, we just understand each other. We have so much in common. We understand each other so well. We've been through so- stuff that's so similar. She values that a lot. And I'm trying to, again, as I'm watching this, try to understand why that has so much meaning to her, but it seems like it has way more to do with her sense of worth and her self-esteem than just, you know, finding a partner that has common experiences because of the the weight, the height that she values it at. That's really interesting. I um, wasn't that deep on that whole point, and I just assumed that she was doing it because that's what she felt she was supposed to do as the Bachelorette. Mm. Um, but that's actually a really interesting point. Um, yeah, I haven't, again, like, can't, like, get my brain... To like, I feel like the hamster that's like on the wheel in my brain is like taking a nap. <laughs> so hopefully by the time we come back next week, I'll be able to formulate my thoughts a little bit more. But like, I'm not just talking about what we saw in this episode. And again, like it, as a therapist, 
like we we look at threads throughout time, patterns throughout time, and this isn't just this episode that we see her mm-hmm. grabbing for for that. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, while we can maybe just chalk it up to immaturity, and that's like how you figure, that's like how you think you're supposed to date when you're younger, maybe. But it feels so much deeper for her because of how low her self esteem appears to be. Mm-hmm. So I'll report yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Uh... I think that basically yeah, wraps us on this date. On the, yeah, here. move on to the group date. Um, so final thoughts. Uh, we both did not think that Jonathan should have gotten a rose. Um, probably should have gone home just by virtue of the fact that they have no chemistry and they are no not on the same page. No romantic chemistry. Both nice people, but th- he's not winning this show. Yeah. And it, it, nothing. They were not actually connecting in these conversations mm-hmm. in any meaningful way. Mm-hmm. So probably shouldn't have gotten a rose. Agree. Cool. All right. Group date. Um, it's time for to get messy or things are going to get messy mm-hmm. or I don't know. My brain's foggy too. Um, I, I mean, they're shoveling shit and then they're <laughs> clipping shit off of sheep's behinds. Uh-huh. I mean, there's, you know, they're, they're corralling sheep into a pen without opening the pen door. This was a fail everywhere. The only interesting part of this was the, uh, the, the husband um, who – you know, had a couple of nice little zinger one-liners, right? And with the just monotone, flat delivery. But I, I mean, I don't even understand how production put this on the schedule. It was so bizarre. I don't know how the farming ever relates back to the relationships, which is what they were trying to do, as you said earlier in the episode. Um, that connection was never properly made for me. Um, like why- I could have seen if they had the guys work in teams of two. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. It just felt like, as you say, it felt like a hazing. It felt like a punishment. <laughs> yeah, which is weird. And like, there's a lot of things you could do on a farm. And it also Why wasn't these like activities. It wasn't even like like in past seasons we've seen them do like actual competitions. There was no. This was like all a group effort. Yeah. You know, there wasn't like who's going to corral the sheep the fastest. It wasn't like who's going to muck up the most shit in a minute. You know, it wasn't yeah, that. Yeah. So like it was just so odd. It, it was like they needed free labor for the day. Or something. Yeah, I, it just it was I, I don't even know what to make of it. I don't even know even what to comment on. There was nothing date related. There was nothing romantic about it. There was, you know, yet you, you had a bunch of idiots running around and shoveling shit like Devin did what Devin does and he took his moment. And the other guys got bullshit about it. But like, I, I, what else are you going to do? I yeah. mean, if I, you're on a dating show, <laughs> you're on a dating show. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know. I, I until you get to the after party, I don't think that there's anything no relevant to talk about here. I agree. Yeah. It was just a literally a waste of of of, of airtime. Um, so we go to the after party and uh, OK. There's a couple things I want to hit on. The bulk of this time has got to be spent on Austin, right? But there's a couple things I got to talk about. Jeremy, uh, even before she said anything, I was like, why is he petting her head? And then she said something and he stops and then he goes back in. He's like, it was weird. Um, I I just thought, I I thought everything about Jeremy's interaction was weird. He was trying to like emotionally connect with her and try to get some touching in, but the emotional connection was wrong and the touching was wrong. It was wrong everywhere. And it was weird. He did not hit the mark. No. Am, am, so, so you agree? <laughs> no. I, I like – I like, and it was one of those – like I don't need your sad story about how you were a little overweight as a kid. Who wasn't? Yeah. We're, it's fine. You're fine. We don't need to hear it. We don't need your sob story. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're a real estate well, investor. I wasn't, I wasn't obese. I was a little, <laughs> a little, a little chunky. And guess yeah. what? I'm afraid to be lonely. Um, okay, same. Yeah. You're you're not special in that respect, Jeremy. Just be just like we don't need your story. This is this is one of those times where it's like don't just throw fake vulnerability at me. Just like yeah. be with me and like let's get to know each other in a different way. And stop petting my fucking head. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awkward to watch. <laughs> it was really weird. It was weird. And it, and even she commented on it at least twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was all weird. So anyway, that Jeremy aside, that was like the comedy of the episode in a very cr- again, heavy cringe in this episode. Um, but this was at least light cringe, a little comedy cringe, you know, it's like, ooh, ooh, he, he had, yeah. he, Jeremy also had the, a comedic moment where he says to Devin, like, did you really think that you should have like, that you were the best farmer today? And Devin <laughs> responds in his Devin way, like, Hey man, like I took initiative. And Jeremy was like, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like immediately changes his face. Um, yeah. so like we get a little sense of his personality and his humor. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, yeah. Yeah. That was it. So after the Jeremy um, 
situation. Petting zoo. Yeah, petting zoo. <laughs> uh, obviously, then we go into the Austin. Uh, Austin goes, interrupts, uh, I think Dylan, or it doesn't matter. So he interrupts somebody. Um, and he comes in to basically let Jen know that he's going to self-eliminate. Uh, I thought this was well foreshadowed. We both predicted it. Um, you know, a few minutes before just seemed like based on the, the face to cameras, uh, or the, in the moments that that's the direction that he was heading. Um, you know, I, I don't think that it was the most articulate. Um, I think Jen did genuinely seem surprised. Um, we've seen no real connection at all. And so I thought her response and reaction, uh, was, uh, out of balance mm -hmm. with, what I would expect. You've got 11 guys here, 12 if you count Matthew, right, who, who just flew in from Boston, basically, to, to want to be with you. And one guy basically says, I am so far behind, and I, I just don't think I can get caught up, and clearly I'm not going to win this thing, so I'm just going to go home now. And this crushes her. She which, craters. I mean, yeah. And, and I, I was watching this, saying to myself, why are you having this response? Like, what what is going on? And I would like the therapist take on why this girl cratered um, for a guy that she had no connection with and wasn't all that interested. It reminded me a lot of, we have a friend, and this friend married now, but when she was dating, um, there was a guy, she went on a, a date with a guy, and she didn't really like the guy. She said, eh, I would give him a second date if he asked me, but you know what? I really wasn't into him and really didn't like him. And then... Uh, the guy reached out and said, Hey, you know, thanks. Had a good time, but I don't think we're the right match. And she was pissed, furious. Couldn't believe it. How dare he reject her? It's like, you didn't like him. You didn't like him. That's kind of what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, that's a good comparison. And, and something that happens a lot in, in dating, like I can reject you, but you can't reject me kind of thing. And it fits, it fits Jen's whole narrative, again, of not being worthy of not being good enough. And, and I think when we have, again, this thought, this like negative core belief about ourselves, our brain does collect evidence to support that. And this is such prime and this is such prime evidence to support that if you want to view it in that way or if your brain wants to view it in that way. And, and so I feel like I have two views of what's happening. There was so much of what Jen was saying um, that I related to so much as a business owner. Hmm. And when she was saying, when she said the thing, am I doing a bad job? And then going through like, is this person going to leave? And is this person going to leave? And is this person going to leave? And, and I'm just not enough and I'll never be enough. And like... I remember feeling that way as a as a new business owner when my like first person resigned and I took it so personally even though they weren't doing a great job and even though I I would have you know if I if I even had the esteem enough to have fired them or invited them to leave I would have but I was crushed and then I was so um Hyper vigilant and so anxious every time I opened my email that someone else was going to resign and I was having like panic experiences of like who's going to be next and it just felt like I, I really did make it about me and I'm I'm really bad at this I'm not doing enough and what more can I do to make people like it here make people stay and and so I was relating to her so hard in that moment because that monologue that she spit out was exactly how I was feeling, what my internal thoughts were, what I, I'm sure I shared with you and my therapist um, at the time. And and so like for that, I related to her and like this is a job that she's doing and she's not doing a good job. She's really not. Um, and I think that when you are new at doing a job, again, I was a new boss. She's a new lead. She's never done this before. That like you don't even know what doing it well means. And so if you're already feeling insecure about the way that you are showing up that when when someone does give you again evidence to support the fact that you're not doing a good job that's how it's going to feel and and so i think that that is a lot of what jen is probably contending with in some way that it is also um her job is also lined up with her love life makes it that much more complicated because she already has that thought and that belief about herself that she's not good enough that no one can love her no one's ever told her that 
you know, she, she's loved before, all of that stuff. And so I think that we just see that. I think that's what I use the word creator very specifically because it feels like she self implodes. We see her kind of crumble um, as a result of, of this. Yeah, I, I think that's actually great insight. Um, you know, for me, I think the most noteworthy comment she made um, was the one around, um, I want to be enough for someone and I wasn't enough for Austin. Mm -hmm. Yes. That might might not have been perfectly phrased, but but um the the reality here is that you have eleven people in the room. Um I promise you that if you get ten or eleven people into a room, you're not gonna match up in in of whatever course. way with somebody. And you're not gonna be enough for you know, one out of ten. Yeah. It's it's still a good good average. No, of yeah. course, of course, and I think again, we when we are really emotional about things, we are not rational. It's really hard for those two things to exist at the same time: heightened emotionality and heightened rationality. We can't we can't do it. And so, in this more heightened emotional state, she can't see that. She can't see that there is, as you pointed out, one person that flew eighteen hours on his own dime to be there, and you know, ten other guys who are dying for time with you. That doesn't matter. Um, we only see the negative. That's again from an evolutionary perspective. That is how our brains are wired to to see the negative, to to look for danger, to look for threats. And so we do tend to highlight the negative more than the positive. Um, that's what helps us stay feel safe. And so that's part of what's happening. So what you're actually describing in behavioral economics is what we call loss aversion bias, right? So what it basically is just saying is that you know the happiness that you uh, attain from something good happening is uh, less than the negative feelings you have from something bad happening. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you think of it as upside downside capture, for those of you who might be finance people, um, you basically have a, you know, a, 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 you know, higher downside capture than upside capture. Um, and uh, I, 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 I th this is actually human nature, because what we what we the assumption that is made in economics is that all people by their very nature are loss averse. Mm. And that is just a rule that you start every assumption by. Yes. Well, yes. And and as, as a therapist, yes, we are driven to seek pleasure and avoid pain, which is why it is always so curious to me as a therapist when someone continues to find themselves in similar dynamics, relationships, situations that don't seem to serve them. Because on some level, they must, right? Like because they're they they we would not be in them if they were that much more painful than the, than pleasurable. And so, I, I always find that so fascinating and always something that I need to explore when my clients again find themselves in in these similar routines, ruts, dynamics. It's like what? How is this serving you in some way? It has to. It has to. As humans, we we wouldn't be able to withstand this if it was that painful. I also want to go back to something um this this concept of enoughness, right? And and so as you as you had quoted, Jen said, um, it seems like I wasn't enough for Austin. The counterpoint to that is this man actually respected you enough to have this conversation with you to your face and be honest with you. He didn't he didn't sugarcoat it. He he was just honest. He was transparent. He let you he could have rode his coattails, your coattails, however the expression goes, into the next destination. He could have just used you. And again, that's rationality speaking, not not um, emotion. And and again, Jen didn't have access to that. But I think that also is something that in, in that emotional state, she's discounting that this was high respect of her to her. Um, good character moment for Austin, mm -hmm. yep. for sure. But But he respected her enough knowing that she is there she is serious. She wants. She says she's serious that she wants to get engaged. Um, she wants to get married. I'm not going to waste your time. You deserve more than that. He literally said that to her. Mm -hmm. And but you know, in those moments, we can't hear it. It's so tempting to to take the plunge to take it personally, as as she did. And then she does what I find was the most. Oh, I'm going to use a really harsh word, disgusting mm -hmm. thing, and that she basically went and asked all the men to tell her how much they liked her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so, and this is where, again, I, I share my experience, like doing a job and feeling insecure in my job and feeling like I was failing. And for the record, there are definitely things that I have could have done better at the time to maybe preserve people or maybe get them out sooner. 
Um, and there's a lot that I've learned from every person that has left my company since it started um, and a lot to be learned from the people that stay as well. Um, but the thing that I did not do was go around and pull my staff, tell them all what happened and tell them all how insecure that I was and and leave the door open for them to tell me what a great job I'm doing because I'm smart enough to know that no one's really actually going to be honest to, with me mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in that moment. And they're just going to tell me what I want to hear. And that's actually not very helpful to me. That is for my own ego and not actually to help me. And, and that is what Jen did. She needed an ego boost and she lined all these men up and she had them tell her one by one why, why they liked her. And how deserving she is to be here. Yeah, I, I love that you bring that up because my notes were were effectively stated the same thing. It was, you know, all the guys then proceed to give her the expected platitudes. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And that that's basically what my notes said. It's all the guys did exactly what they were expected to do. There was nothing out of the box, interesting, unique about anything. Uh, you know, they were all given an assignment. What were they supposed to do? Oh, oh no, they were all given an assignment and they all just, and, and, it, and it's it, where the answers were already in the back of the book and they just opened the back of the book, wrote the answers down and moved on with life. Mm -hmm. And then we don't end up getting, uh, you know, a rose for the date, which I, I actually agree. Like, how could you? There was like, Jen basically torpedoed the the group date part. There was nothing to give a rose a, um about for the for the day portion mm -hmm. of this date so it was all going to come down to what happened in the cocktail party and the only guy who seemingly seemed to get any real meaningful time with her was the one who was petting her so i don't think he's getting it right and then so yeah it was it was um i think it was a really bad look for yeah. jen in this date i i agree and the other thing that i'll say i empathized a lot with her when she was talking about you know, I haven't told them. She was talking to the producer, like or, or whoever was doing the ITM. Um, you know, it, I haven't told them because it breaks the facade that I'm this confident woman, and if they see um, how worthless I am, um, you know, they, they won't want to be here. And again, that's something me being in this role as a business owner that I've really struggled with is like trying to balance me feeling, um, you know, burnt out, for example, but still trying to be a leader and be trying to figure out what what being a strong leader or a good leader means and my own worry around like if I show vulnerability is that weakness are people going to um to not respect me if I let them know that I get stressed or that I'm overwhelmed or you know if I kind of like um get have a little bit of a shorter uh, tone with them um at times or if I let them know how hard it really is to do this um and I've really struggled with that grappled with that for the last almost 8 years and I still haven't really struck a balance but but when she said that too I I, again, really resonated with her. Do I then take the opportunity to talk with my team about that? No. <laughs> talk to my therapist about that and you. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, I always like to think about what what notes do I have for her? What could she have done differently? I think that she still could have used it as an opportunity to be vulnerable with the guys, to be to be authentic and to say, like, just wanted to let you know, I sent Austin home. To be honest, it's got me a little in my head and it's bringing up some stuff for me, but I really want, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight. I'm happy that you're here and I want to just spend time with you all. Like, you know, I, I think that would have been enough. I think that would have been vulnerable enough. And I, I think that could have still kept them on track mm -hmm. to move forward. But I don't, Jen's not there. Like that's, yeah. And I think that's where like she got, she played right in the producer's hand. The producer basically fed her the the breadcrumbs to to go tell the men, and she took it. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think I have anything to add. No. I think you've said a lot, a, a lot, <laughs> and and said it wonderfully. Okay, we can move on to the last date of the night, the last, the second one on one with Grant. Yep. Um, and uh, let's, I I I did not like the horseback riding uh, a million miles apart from each other. The picnic was a cute idea, did not execute well with the rain coming in, and you know he was very the, sweet though in the he, way that he, yeah. he he was with her. I, I think we've said all right. Grant was the all star of the episode. Mm -hmm. He got such a great look. Um, he he really showed level headedness and maturity that I, we hadn't really seen. Uh, we you know hints at in, in but this is really the episode where we got to see a lot of him. Um, I feel a lot better about him now than I did after episode one. Same. Um, but the date. You know, not great uh, all around. I think it doesn't really even get interesting until you get to the dinner. Um, in the dinner portion, he he kind of falls into the same trap. I think that a lot of the other guys fall into, and they're trying to get to the trauma 
Um, and they're not, it doesn't feel natural mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel necessarily genuine. And he goes right into wanting to talk about his father who was an addict. And look, at, I, I get that's an important part of your character. Is that what I'm leading with? No, it just felt forced to me. Um, and once again, Jen is in the same situation where does not know how to connect and she falls into the same trauma trading and, you know, into the turning it back to her own, you know, experiences and her, you know, and how it, it's somehow going to relate back to her. Um, you know, so I, I just felt like. I don't even know how we got from him saying my mission in life is to be the man that my father wasn't to her saying, well, my toxic ex um, was um, a racist and he told me that racism doesn't exist. Like, yeah. How? How, do, how do those two things connect? How did we get here? Yeah, yeah. How like how invalidating to to what Grant shared, which was so again vulnerable, honest, important. Mm -hmm. Um, it just I I really I rolled my eyes at that one. That was, and again, not to discredit Jen, her ex does sound like an asshole. All I'm not I'm not saying you know all, any anything that what she shared wasn't terrible. I'm just saying that wasn't the right time. Mm -hmm. it doesn't always have to be about even though the show is called The Bachelorette. Part of your job is creating and facilitating opportunities for you to get to know these men, right? Mm -hmm. It's not all about you in that sense. You know, a lot of this, and I'm sure no one in our audience is going to be able to relate to this, but a lot of it reminds me of being the dungeon master in a Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> game. You know, so so the dungeon master runs a game. He mm -hmm. creates the plot. He creates the whole storyline. I have and, a better example. When you're okay. Done. Well, but 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 but. You have you generally have two types of, of dungeon masters. You have a dungeon master who thinks this is my game and these players are playing in my game. And, you know, if they don't like it, they can get out and a new player can come in. And then you have the type of DMs that like I was. And that was like, I'm just facilitating a situation and I want my players to have the best time. And I want to give them opportunities to do the cool things that they want to do. It's not going to be an open book. Like, they're not just going to be able to do whatever the hell they want to do. But, like, I want them to have a good time. Tell me what your dreams are of this situation. And let's find a way to make it happen so we can all have a fun time together. The bachelorette or the bachelor, that's what they should be doing. A facilitator. Faci you are a facilitator, right? You are, yes, it's about you and your game, right? But at the end of the day, there are all these other people playing in your game. And they should be having fun and be getting their opportunities to be validated or have opportunities to talk about themselves or, uh, you know, have interesting opportunities to go on all these things. Like, it's more than just about you. And I think it says a lot about somebody's readiness for a relationship to not see that, right? When you're in a relationship, the first thing I think of when I think about our relationship is what am I supposed to do for you today? I wake up in the morning and the first thought I have is what do I need to do for my wife today? to make sure that her life is good and what what she needs is facilitated. And then after I've figured out and reminded myself of what those things are, then I think about, oh, and what do I need to do for me today? Jen is not there yet. That's very sweet. It's not sweet. It's the way relationships are supposed to be. Well, you know, it, it reminds, it re okay, so. If you think it's sweet, the bar is set really freaking low on relationships right now. It reminds me, the, the example that you gave about um, d and Great example, everybody. I know it, you all it, love it. It was, and I can actually follow it. But it reminds me a lot of planning a wedding as well, right? Like I helped a lot with our wedding. No, no. I'm saying there are some people that are like, this is my wedding. Mm. This is what I want. I don't give a crap how much it's going to cost, um, how much it's going to cost our guests to come. Um, I don't care what they think of the menu. I don't care what they think of the music. This is my day, mm. our day, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> or... There are people that look at their wedding as though they are hosting a party. And yeah, they set the parameters. They they do think about what, what songs do I really want to hear? What food would I really enjoy? And then kind of, again, creating the boundaries and the parameters um, in which their guests can kind of have some choice and, and have some free reign to have fun within an experience that the hosts have like thoughtfully curated and cultivated for them. With of course their own needs in mind too, but like I think that's also relating back to what you had said, and it was reminding me of our wedding where when we were doing the we had a great wedding. We did have a great wedding. We thought a lot about our guests and the people that were in our wedding and our you know our our families and all of that stuff. Um, first and foremost, when we thought about our wedding and our menu was a really good example of that because um, we had gone to our tasting and. 
That um, corn chowder was Corn chowder amazing. was incredible. But guess what? We got married on July 27th in the middle of a heat wave. So we thought, you know what? Probably not best to serve our guests this chowder, even though it was oh, so fucking delicious. delicious. Yeah. And we chose something different instead. Um, and we still got the chowder. Yeah, they um, did. They actually they, went they, to another wedding that day was actually going with the chowder. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and our they, wedding coordinator uh, brought went, went to that wedding and scooped out two bowls of the chowder and brought it to ours for us. Yeah, that was, that was pretty. So she got a big tip for that one. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like that that kind of small decision of like, yeah, if it was just about us, fuck everybody else. You eat the chowder on this hot day, um, but we didn't do that. Yeah, no, that's that's probably a more relatable example than <laughs> than my Dungeons and Dragons one. Um, but yeah, I, I look at I, yeah, you should be thinking about. Uh, you, you talk about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go deep into the headspace here. Okay. Um, you're a systems therapist. Okay. okay right. Sure. Is that right terminology? I'm, I'm trained in systems. Systems theory. theory, and that means that you are part of a system, and that you have to be thinking about how your actions impact those who are in the system with you, or well, how you impact the system. Wh- whether you're thinking about it or not, it's a reality that yes. your actions impact other people, and other people within your system or the system in general impacts you. Yes. It's symbiotic. And I don't think at this moment in time, Jen understands that, um, you know, there are other people in the system at this mm-hmm. moment with her. Mm-hmm. And I think that's problematic. Yeah. It indicates a lack of readiness for marriage. Uh, just a lack of awareness mm-hmm. too. And, and yeah, I get along with that um, lack of readiness for marriage or, or a serious relationship. Um, so so was there any part of this date that we liked? Uh, I, I mean, mean, Grant. I like Grant. Other than Grant. Great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. I mean, he did get a date, Rose. Yep. Um, this one felt earned and deserved. Totally. Yeah. Grant um, was Grant was amazing. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Okay, we can just move on to the rose ceremony. Second one of the day. Oh, oh, oh second, second one of right, the episode. Right. Cocktail party. We got fifteen well, seconds I mean. of a cocktail that, party. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like the rose rose yeah, ceremony yeah. part of the evening. Two rose ceremonies, no cocktail parties. Yes, and this was another time where it was kind of like. You were like, why? Like, Jen had said something, and you were like, I have no idea what Jen even just said. It was weird. She's, it's, and, and it's like, oh, wait, basically, we're not having a cocktail party. I already know today. what I want. Yeah. And I, I was like, helped me understand what I want and what I deserve. And so I don't need to talk to any of you. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was a little, little confused. Um, maybe it was because I was really sick when we watched <laughs> it and I was a little out of it. And at this point, it's like, you know, way past my bedtime and I'd already, already sucked down a half hour earlier some NyQuil. Um, so maybe it was just me, but I was I was like really confused by the whole mm-hmm. set of events that had happened. They're gathered right before the rose ceremony. Mm-hmm. We get into the rose ceremony, and again, no no big shocks here. Um, the person that goes home via rose ceremony is Dylan, mm-hmm. and um, and then we are left with nine guys. Nine guys, yeah. We drop down to uh, no. We started the episode with eleven. Uh, first rose ceremony. Uh, I mean, twelve if you count Matthew. Mm-hmm. Um, and we lose two plus Matthew mm-hmm. at the first rose Thomas, ceremony. Thomas, John, Thomas, and John. Yep. And then we uh, proceed to lose Austin in a self elimination and Dylan in the That's second right. rose ceremony. Yeah. So four or five guys, depending on how you want to count it. So we went all the way from eleven down to seven. So remaining, the safe ones were Jonathan and Grant, and then we have Sam, Devin, Marcus, uh, Jeremy, and Spencer. And so those are our top seven at this mm. moment. Now, I'm happy you asked about my rose this week. Love it. My thorn this week. I hated to see that. Shall we get into rose and thorn? Rose and thorns. Uh, what do you want to start with, roses or thorns? Let's start with thorns. I'm feeling thorny. You're feeling thorny. Okay. Well, give me a thorn. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. Um, I'm very thorny about this sickness. This sucks. Podcasting when you got a sore throat, it's like knives stabbing into my throat. And it's just getting worse the longer we talk. So that's how that's, I felt last week. That's a week. pretty aggressive, heavy thorn I've got this week. Yeah, I have such brain fog. Yeah, brain um, fog, second thorn. Yeah, <laughs> super bullshit. My thorn this week was Jen, but more specifically, Jen's self-centeredness and her defensiveness. Like just, and if I were to even be more specific, the one side eye drink swig response to um, Jonathan on their one-on-one date when he when she perceived that. Um, he was challenging her, uh, it was, and it would have been a gentle challenge. That was like, oof, I do not like that. Mm-hmm. Um, do not like that at all. So that was, I think, my thorn of the episode. Yeah, I'm in the same category. Uh, my thorn is the fact that Jonathan got a date rose. And it's not because I don't like Jonathan. I think he's a cool guy. I want to hang out with him and be buddies with him. Um, but like, you're supposed to eliminate people that 
are not going to win. Mm -hmm. He's not differentiating in any way. He's not, you know, like I, I can't imagine production is going to fight hard for him specifically. Um, and he's not going to win this show and you don't have chemistry. Why did you give him a rose? I don't get it. Let's move on. Like I would much um, rather have seen Dylan, right? I would have much rather seen uh, Jonathan not get the rose, see Austin self-eliminate and have Dylan still be in there. Because I think Dylan is a more interesting, you know, candidate going forward than Jonathan is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish we saw more of Dylan. I, yeah. I really liked him a lot. What about your rose? Uh, I really liked the return, Max. Max's return to the podcast, even though he doesn't want to uh, show his face today. <laughs> He's being shy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, there wasn't a lot in this episode I liked. Oh, um, but in terms of roses, what did we like about this episode? Um, Grant. I, uh, I think Grant was fun. Uh, but I, I really, the, the farming husband guy with with his with his um One not a lot of collective intelligence going on there i would have started by opening the gate that you're trying to push him through i think that was maybe the happiest i was in the entire episode <laughs> and jen's response the defensive response of like you know it's like i i like that entire exchange yeah i did too that yeah was that was funny. another moment of her defensiveness yeah. um yeah he was funny um my rose is is for grant mm -hmm. i like being able to see a bit more of him. Um, I liked being like able to hear his story. I liked the way that he didn't villainize his father, um, but was still able to talk about, um, you know, wanting to make different choices or be a different type of man than his father. I think that's a really hard thing to do. He gave a lot of empathy to his father and said, this is his first time living too, which as kids, as, you know, children of our parents, like it's really hard to remember that. And I think that that is just, again, a mature, empathetic view of of a parent who is fallible and who has really disappointed you in, in, in ways, you know, I imagine that his dad did. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, the the layers that we're getting to see of Grant, I, I really have appreciated. Yeah. No, I agree. I liked Grant this episode. Definitely changed my perspective on him uh, pretty significantly. Yeah. Um, can I add in another thorn? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> All the thorns. Well, so we, we got to see the teaser for the rest of the season. And I'm like not excited. I'm not excited about any part of it. No. It's like there's no part of what they are forecasting for us. And that's supposed to be, again, a teaser, something that we're supposed to get like really into and get thirsty about. And I like don't, none of it looks, into, I'm not, I'm out. I'm like not invested. I'm, I'm really obviously going to still watch and we're going to still talk about it every week. But I'm, I'm really... I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I agree. I personally have thought the trailers have been overwhelmingly weak for the entire season. The big thing was supposed to be this Matthew, you know, showing, yeah, showing up. back up. Yep. Yeah. And that was a complete and utter letdown. Um, and there's really, that they hung their hat kind of on that. And there's nothing, doesn't appear to be anything. So now we're what we're getting is this, you know, I can't let you propose to me at the altar. The problem is like, one that could be anything. I think. I, I think we could all make some predictions about what could happen there. Um, I don't think it's going to be as juicy as the trailer suggests it's going to be. And I. I have one thought about something it could be. And if it is that, I literally might throw the remote through the TV, and we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, and my fear is that it's going to actually be that, um, which would be the literally the most dumb ignorant thing ever and that's my big concern i guess time will tell i hope for that too not. well now that the, the gang has has all come together it is time for us to uh, pack it up for the day um but we will be back next week with episode six of Jen's season of the bachelorette but until then you can follow along with us on instagram at reactivity tv you can follow me on instagram at amy albero lcsw be sure to also check out our other podcast, Wishing You Well, which you can find on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can find us on YouTube as well at Wishing You Well by Revive Center for Wellness and Wishing You Well Pod on Instagram. We will be back next week with more. We'll see you then. Bye. See ya.